Our first reading on this feast of Septuagesima comes from the lesson of St. Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. Brethren, know you not that they run in a race, all indeed run, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every one that striveth for the mastery refraineth oneself from all things, and they indeed that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible one. I therefore so run, not as at an uncertainty. I so fight, not as one beating the air, but I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. For I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all in Moses were baptized in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. And they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with, the most, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord, according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like to a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers unto his vineyard. And having agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And he said to them, Go you also into my vineyard, and I will give you what shall be just. And they went their way, And again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did in like manner. But about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They said to him, Because no man has hired us. And he said to them, Go you also into my vineyard. And when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and pay them their hire, beginning from the last even to the first. When they came, therefore, they received those of the eleventh hour, they received every man the denarii. But when the first came, they thought that they should receive more. And they also received every one a denarii. And receiving it, they murmured against the master of the house, saying, These last have worked but one hour, and thou hast made them equal to us that have borne the burden of the day and the heats. But he answering them said to them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for one denarii? Take what is thine and go thy way. I will also give to this last even as to thee. Or is it not lawful for me to do what I will? Is thy eye evil because I am good? So shall the last be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. For many are called, few are chosen. One was chosen, the most humble of humblest of us all. And she, kneeling before Almighty God, offering her day, offering all to the glory of God, saw that angel appear to her who asked her, Will you give God your human nature? When you woke up this morning, will you give God your human nature? All that you are and all that you can become. Will you give God a human nature? And she said, Fiat voluntas tua, thy will be done. And on the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ looked down upon his mother and said, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. And we stand there, you and I, with St. John, and we realize we have been given the most wonderful of all mothers, our Mary. And so we turn to Mary and ask her to help us this day 
understand the times in which we live and the time in which we, as individuals, must save our souls. And so we pray together as Mary's children, asking that the heavenly dew come upon each one of us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. He was only 12 years old, and he was excited. He was coming to school for the first time, and he was meeting that person that they called a living saint. And he was walking in that room, and he saw on the window of the office of St. John Bosco these words, Domiki animas, cetere tole. Give me souls, take away the rest. Nothing matters in this world if I've lost my soul. Everything is lost. If I save my soul, everything is saved. And so he walked into that room and he said, I see around here in this school you deal in souls. Will you make my soul beautiful for Almighty God? And Don Bosco took out a handkerchief. And he began to make the handkerchief into a little rabbit. And then into a little elephant. And the little fellow was watching and he says, Don Bosco said to him, If you become as pliable in my hand as this handkerchief, you shall become a great saint. And so it would be for Dominic Savio, becoming a great saint. Every one of us has to realize that this parable is about our souls. Each one of us has the gift of God, a soul. How many of you have saved a soul? How many of you have lifted up your heart in the beginning of the day as this good householder, which is Christ, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sanctifier, He comes out unto His own the beginning of the day, and He says, Go into the vineyard. Where is it? It's right here in you. Your heart, your soul. That's the vineyard of God. He doesn't want anything else. He comes here for one purpose only. To perfect our soul. He could begin with his little girl today who says, like little Saint Catherine of Siena, I want to give my entire life over to the glory of God. We have a day and we have an age. In this day, you and I began our morning either looking to Almighty God and saying to Almighty God, give me the opportunity today to save a soul. If I can save a soul today, I know I will help to sanctify the soul that you have given to me. I could have started right away this morning. But now we come out at the ninth hour, which would be the third hour, because each one of these hours is the hour of prayer. The beginning of the day, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, then the eleventh hour, are all the hours of prayer. During our day, do we lift up our hearts and minds at these various hours to say to Almighty God, Remind me, Lord, there may be a sacrifice that you have for me today that I might save a soul, a sinner who is dying. As Our Lady at Fatima asked, There are many souls, my dear children, that are falling into hell. There is hell. It's a reality. They saw the sulfurous Flumes, because there is no light in hell, it's all darkness. And they saw these souls boiling like in water. And they were afraid. Thank God they only had an instant to see it. They said, oh, if we had stayed there longer, we would have died. But, she said, many souls are going there because Catholics... No one, eat, no one prays and makes a sacrifice for them. I'm asking you, have you made a sacrifice? Have you decided that you're going to be a worker in the vineyard of God? Have you decided that you're going to seek out souls instead of griping and complaining? How many of you have decided to happily serve Almighty God in seeking a soul you may not see? 
until that day you come to judgment. The day you come before Almighty God. He says, now the hours are over, my friend. Your life is through, my friend. And you come before Almighty God, and you follow the pattern of praying every day for a soul, sacrificing for a soul. Now, God sees you. He says, look. And you see these lights, (coughs) these bright, beautiful features, people coming to you, and they hug you, and they kiss you, and they say, thank you, thank you. And you look at them, and you say, I've never seen you. Who are you? I'm a soul that you saved by making the sacrifice on this day. I'm a soul you saved on this day. Thousands. And they say, Come, blessed of the Father. A.U.J., well done. You go, Wow, I never thought I was doing anything. I humbly did simple things. And it saved so many souls. The power in this world... has been denied us because the mystery of the mystical body has been completely gutted. Gutted. We no longer realize the power that we have in humility. The pride is abounding. And that pride has to be destroyed if we are to find the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and find the souls that will satisfy the kingdom of heaven. We live, you and I, as Catholics, to seek to save souls. From the littlest one of us to the oldest. (coughs) This seeking for souls, ultimately, means that I must pass through the purgative life. I can't save a soul if I'm attached to mortal sin. I will never receive that friendship with God that I need to have in order to gain the graces for another person. So the purgative life, the purgative life, if I'm attached, this is how I find out whether I'm attached, if I'm attached to any sin, I will be divisive. I will seek to divide others. My speech will be divisive. I will be at odds with the other individual. I will make myself his opponent rather than his proponent, rather than be an accuser of your brothers, you then would say, I want to be the advocate for my brother. The one in sin, the one who is attached to this world and the things of this world, is always the opponent of the brother, always envious of the brother, always seeking to put down the other. And you would say, examining your conscience, if this is the way in which I am living, then I need to change. And how do I change? God has given us the way. Everything is corrected. When I stretch, I swim every day. And I know that every stroke is corrected. If you stretch, the more you contradict yourself, the more you close in on yourself, the more you destroy that ability to stretch and to do the stroke correctly. In the spiritual life, it's the same. I must always seek to give the greatest glory to God the householder, the one who will give us the denarius. There's only one thing everyone wants. It's not a million dollars, it's not a trillion, it's not a billion. It's salvation. It is living with God for all eternity. Dante pictures it so beautifully. That when we are in the kingdom of God, we must pass through two rivers. The first river... Is the river which he will tell you is the memory of all things in your life that were not good. You have to pass through the river of this forgetfulness. I must forget everything that ever happened, that ever caused me difficulty, any sin. I must forget it. I can't bring anything of sin into the kingdom of heaven. So there has to be this river. And the earthly paradise gives Dante the opportunity to say the river is that river, which is the river of forgetfulness. 
The river in which I completely eliminate from my mind any resentment, bitterness, judgment. The second river embellishes its noe, yuo bonoe, the river of good thoughts, the river of good deeds. When I come to that river, everything that I did, every word that I said that embellished and helped the love of God is increased, multiplied. In other words, I'm praising Almighty God for every song that I sang that praised Him, every word that I had that praised Him. I had a man who was dying in California. His wife called me to come over. He was dying of cancer and he had a hole in his side. And all things came out that hole. The only thing he could do to talk to you is have Lord's holy water. And he'd drink the holy water and speak. I came there to anoint him. And in praying, all of a sudden, I said to him, When was the last time you went to confession? Oh, Father, seven years ago. Seven years ago. Then I heard the confession of the man, anointed him, and then asked him another question. Are you willing to join your sufferings to the sufferings of Christ? Are you willing to get out of being bitter over this thing called cancer? He was 46 years. He had seven sons. Every one had a J. Joseph, James, all of them. And here they were. They were working the shop that he had. They were doing everything to keep the family together, pay the bills and everything else. Can you save souls? Can you join your suffering to the sufferings of Christ? I'll think about it, Father began to pray over it. Every day I would come and I'd bring the epiphany water to cast out demons. i sprinkle him with epiphany water and i have him drink the epiphany water with the Lord's water. And he asked me a question. He said, Father, I've been thinking. But Father, I have to question you. Tell me. You see my sons and my wife, they're doing all the work for me. They're caring for me. He says, I was a coach. I coached basketball, baseball, track with my sons and all boys and everything else. He says, I was a coach, but what can I do now? What can I do now? Laying in this bed, sacrificing, as you said, every bit of my body, every wound and every suffering that I endure. What can I do For my brother, my sister, my family, what can I do? I said to him, James, you were a coach. You are a good coach. Now God is asking you to coach your children, coach your family, coach everyone you know on how to stand before God. Can you do that? He looked at me and says, I can do it. The doctors told him, you cannot go anywhere, you cannot drive anywhere. He said, Father, I want to go back to where I was baptized. The Sanctuario in Arizona, New Mexico. I said, Jim, you have one will. And that will you place in God's hands. And you do what you have to do. Don't worry about what doctors say. All right. He gathered up his family of seven boys and his wife. And he headed out in his van to the Sanctuario in New Mexico. It was around Easter time. So it would be a little bit later than this. He spent Easter there. And he had all his families there. And on Easter day, after the Mass, he got up before his family. And Merle, his wife, told me, for 30 minutes... He spoke on what was most important as he approached the throne of God. The acts of love. The giving of self. The union with Christ in sacrifice. These were bright and glorious in his eyes. And Merle said he spoke for 30 minutes on these wonders of God. 
And the marvelous thing was, he needed no water. It was Wednesday after Easter. I was in chapel when I received the call that he had died. You want to know where that person goes, you look at the wife. Because two are joined together. And she was joyful. What her husband had done. He came at the 11th hour. He changed his life and sanctified all the things that were before. Now they became glorious in Almighty God because he now recognized at that time it was God who was giving him the power to do whatever good, to think whatever thought was important, to speak the words that he had to speak. When will we start saving souls? You and I. Did we start today at the first hour of the day when we got up? Or do we concern ourselves about everything else under the sun but saving a soul? Are you Catholic? Are you going to get to heaven? Each one of us is going to be tested. That is why what took place in the Garden of Eden, we are priests. We are reading about it now in the breviary. At first, God created this world. He created the world and then He created man. He gave man three gifts. He gave man immortality. You will not die. He gave man impassibility. You will not get sick. And He gave man this gift of infused knowledge. Now, man was outside of time. When did time begin? I asked a lawyer. He started scratching his chin. He says, I thought it always was. I said, no, it began. Time has a beginning and time has an end. This world has a beginning, it has an end. Every life has a beginning and has an end. When did time begin? The Catholic knows it began when we sinned. When Eve grasped at equality with God. And at that moment, that very moment, she died to impassibility, died to immortality, died to the infused knowledge. And now you and I are in time. Look at it. We are in time. T. We are being tested. We are being tested, each and every one of us, to find out whether or not we will I grow in our intimate love of God. You have so much time to grow in the intimacy and the love of God. And that growth is going more important when you're saving a soul. And then guess what happens? M. This intimacy that you establish in your life today, in this world today, will conquer the evil one who threatens you, and it will be the measure of your eternal life. Every time you look at a watch, every time you think of time, you think of it. I'm being tested. And I'm being tested on my love. And I'm being tested in my love in order that I might have a place in the kingdom of heaven measured my eternal life. Many are called. Few are chosen. How do you know if you're chosen? <coughs> Listen to what you talk about. Look at what you think about. How often do you read anything spiritual? How often do you pray the rosary? Three times a day? Four times a day? Or just maybe once a day? How often do you place yourself in the presence of God at each and every holy hour, the first hour of the day, the third hour of the day, the ninth hour, the sixth hour, the eleventh hour? When are you going to decide that eternity is more important than anything that is happening in this world today? Don't talk to me about SSPX. Don't talk to me about resistance. Don't talk to me about anything but saving souls. That's it. And the moment you start focusing upon sanctifying your soul, what will happen? Light the sparks of fire. You rise to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the light of lights. And as you rise closer to that light, what happens? You join with other souls. 
Dante has a most important image of heaven. He sees souls going up and down and around. And every nine spheres, of the spheres are governed by the nine choirs of angels, their sphere is a deeper understanding and love of God. And guess what happens? As I am receiving this light, I want to do what? Give it to Him. And He says, I want to give it to another, and another, and another. And every one of us now is increasing in our knowledge, the infused knowledge of God and the love of God. There can be nothing in heaven that is of Satan. No bad thought, no criticism, no sin. And so in the kingdom of heaven it's brilliant light. And thus our blessed mother on Fatima did what? She took the light of this world, the greatest light of ever, and she twirled it with her finger. And sparks went out and people saw and said, Wow, what a miracle! She said, many souls are falling into hell because they have no one to pray and make a sacrifice. And then that sun began to come down. And everybody thought it was the end of the world and dove into the mud. And then all of a sudden it rose back into its place and there were no clouds, no mud. There was only clean, beautiful, day, blue skies. And they looked at one another and they saw, we're perfectly clean. The blind could see. The little girls jumped for joy. Their dresses were bright and glorious. Everyone began to realize God had spoken. And God said to us, I want my mother honored. I want Russia, which is the seat of all heirs of communism, of Satanism, of ecologism, of feminism. I want Russia consecrated. For that pride of Russia must be subordinated to the humility of my mother. And we have in our country an organization known as a CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. The Central Intelligence Agency came along and offered the Pope a way for peace. It was not of God's way, but it was of man's way. And so Colonel Paul came up to others, Michelle Sedon, other CIA agents. And after they had basically come together, they said, how will we fund one another? How will we make intercessions? How will we find ourselves doing whatever we want in this world, shooting, killing, murdering, doing that in order to establish a government that we want, a global government. How will we do it, they said. And Colonel Paul said, I have the answer. In America, there are ghettos of blacks. These ghettos of blacks, we bring in heroin. We drug them. And that money, that black money, we will take to fund our murdering of societies, our destroying of all that is good. How shall we move that money, they said. Well, at that same time, Pope Pius XII was asking the question, how might we save Italy from falling into the hands of the communists, falling into the hands of Satan? We have to build up the Christian Democratic Party. Where will we get the money? Ah, the black money coming from America needed a place to be laundered and hence the Vatican Bank. And Cardinal Archbishop Marcinkus worked with them and said, this, dear Holy Father, this 20% of all this black money, billions of dollars, you can use to build up 60 different spots where the Christian Democratic Party can keep Italy Catholic. Now it's Catholicism versus communism. But Catholicism using black money. And now we have a situation where the CIA and the Vatican are working together and they say who might we have to move the drugs to carry on this work and guess who came to mind Lucky Luciano the mafiosa and the mafiosa now 
feeds the Vatican Bank all their funds to be laundered in seven different places. The Bank of Ambrosiano. Here we have St. Ambrose, and now his name is used as a bank, and that bank was taken over by Michelle Sedona. And Michelle Sedona said, Now, Holy Father, we can save you. Now it's Pope Paul VI. We can save you. You will not have to pay anything. No taxes to Italy. We sell everything you have, and I'll buy it, and I will use these different places, these phony spots, to give you more money. And then Pope John Paul II used that billions of dollars to fund solidarity, to battle communism, we said, as a Catholic Church. Can we battle communism, evil with evil? Can we? So this is the Satan we're in. It's the 11th hour. The world is being inundated with satanic activity. From the highest to the lowest. Don't worry about the SSBX. Don't worry about the Olympic State. Don't worry. Save your soul. Focus on your soul. If you become saints, then we are all moving toward the sun. And as we move toward the sun, we will draw others to move toward the sun. We have to have a bigger vision. This myopic vision is crushing us. And you then open your minds and hearts and your eyes like Jim did. And you say, the only thing that matters is that I learn to love every day. And if I'm learning to love every day, I'm learning to sacrifice every day for a soul that I will not know until I come to my judgment. Like a woman I had in El Paso came to me and she says, I've been going to confession seven years every week, Father. And saying the same thing. I said, you are spiritually insane. What is that, she said. I said, if I was going to the bank and depositing $100 every day into a situation where the person just takes it and spends it, and I'm losing all my money, you would say, that's a stupid investment, wouldn't you? Yes. You'd be financially insane. Well, you're going into the bank of Almighty God, and you're saying the same thing over it. You have no intention of changing. God isn't going to change anything in your life until you begin to understand what He's saying by the event. What is your sin? I'm fighting with my husband every day. Oh, did you say for better or for worse? Yeah. I said, then God took you at your word. Now, your husband is your means of becoming a saint. God has asked you, will you help me save a soul? Every time your husband irritates you, will you help me save a soul? The father is asking you, dear daughter... What are you going to say? What did you say? I asked her. She said, I guess I said no. I said, you better believe you said no. Now, seven years. You had seven years. Imagine the thousands of souls you could have saved in those seven years by being a subordinate, humble woman, wife, mother. If you went before Almighty God right now, I said to her, You'd see thousands of souls, black, ugly, griping and complaining. They say, there she is. That's the one who should have saved my soul. She didn't do it. What would you feel like? Pretty small, she said. I said, now supposing you change. And supposing now you go home and you start saying, I can save a soul every time I'm patient and quiet and humble and dealing with my husband. And I said, then you come back and see me. Well, two weeks later, she was at Mass. She came running up to me and she said, Father, do you remember me? I said, I cannot forget you. <laughs> Guess what, Father? In the last two weeks, I saved 13 souls. I said, how many times did you get angry with your husband? Zero. Seven years. As soon as he got the meaning of what God is trying to say, change. What hour will it be? It be the hour of prayer. You begin to see in your life, I'm in the purgative life. I'm stuck in the purgative life. I'm dividing everybody. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm saying the same thing in confession. Always, always, always. And I'm not understanding how to become the saint. Because God called all of us to sanctity. 
We will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless we are saints. And that is the most joyful thing we can be, the saint that God wants us to be. But I want to read you a story from St. Gregory the Great, the Pope. And this story, I must say, made a deep impression upon me. Because if I didn't read it, I couldn't have believed it. It happens to come from this week, the Fathers of the Church. It is St. Gregory's particular sermon on this day. He was concluding the sermon. And in his conclusion of his sermon, he tells a story about his particular monastery. In the monastery, a young man came. Okay? He says this, I shall now, brethren, relate to you something which has happened recently. And if from your heart you look upon yourselves as sinners, you will then love yet more the omnipotent mercy of God. In this very year, in my monastery, which is situated close to the church of the blessed martyrs John and Paul, a certain brother turned to repentance, entered the monastery, was devoutly accepted, and became himself yet more devoutly changed in his life. His brother followed him into the monastery, in flesh, not in spirit. For, though detesting the monastic dress and the monastic life, he remained in the monastery as a guest, and he was unable to discontinue living there because he shunned the life of the monks and because he had neither occupation nor the means to live on his own. He was a parasite on the monastery. His evil conduct was a burden to all, yet all endured him with the patience and love of a brother. And though he knew not what followed after this present life, yet arrogant and uncertain, he scoffed if anyone wished to instruct him in eternal salvation. And so flippant in speech, restless in movement, empty in mind, disorderly in dress, dissipated in behavior, he lived on in the monastery, but in the disposition of the world. During the month of July, last, he was stricken down with the epidemic of pestilence that you remember. And as he was approaching his end, he was urged to put his soul in order. The power of life now remained only in his heart and his tongue. His extremities were already dead. The brethren stood around him, helping him in his end by their prayers, so as to make God present to him. Suddenly, beholding the demon, the demon appeared. The demon coming to take possession of him, he began to cry out in a loud voice, Look, I am being delivered over to the dragon to be devoured. The monastery saw this dragon. He cannot devour me because of your prayers. Why do you delay me? Stop praying. Go away that he may finish me. And when the brethren exhorted him to make the sign of the cross, he answered as well as he was able, I want to bless myself. I cannot because I am held fast by this dragon. The dragon had him in his clutches and hear the gosh the, the mouth of the dragon was over his head salivating ready to consume him and the brothers began to pray more and more and more when all of a sudden the whole image of the demonic disappeared the young man was given time but debility he did not get complete healing he used that suffering from that point on to make reparation for his life eleventh hour God showed him the mercy the brothers said at his death the angels came and took him two things we must remember first we must not presume that you and I are headed to the kingdom of heaven we must not presume it we must work out our salvation day by day day by day and never take it for granted seek to save other souls Second, never presume that the other person is going to go to hell. 
presume that God has a way in which He might mercifully bring that soul back to the kingdom of heaven. Never give up on anyone. We do not know who will be the person that saves my brother's soul. Maybe one of you. But we must come back to the mystery we are celebrating. All hours, all ages, all times are summed up in this one sacrifice. All. And you come to it and we come to it with reverence. Because it is the Holy of Holies. And because each one of us knows the householder, Christ our Lord. He is our King. And so, if we are to claim as our King, we must begin to do the work in His vineyard. We must sanctify our souls. There's no other work that's more important in this world. That is why we simply say, if you save your soul, you've saved everything. If you lose this soul, you've lost everything. How might you gain your soul? You might gain your soul by the 24 narrow doors. Pick. Have we had anyone who does the corporal works of mercy? Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. These are things that we can do in our little neighborhoods. Teach the spiritual works of mercy. Speak about the faith to others. Try to open their minds up to the truth. We have a lot to conquer. We have an unholy alliance between the CIA, the mafiosa, the Vatican. We cannot worry about them. We must worry about saving our souls. And know that things are bigger than you and I. Only our Blessed Mother, the humblest of all creatures, will put all things back in order. And then be calm be happy because these are the times in which we can become the great saints that God wants us to be we just never thought we'd be asked to be that so thank almighty God for this moment thank almighty God for everything never complain because God is in charge and he has the devil on a leash and when he says enough enough and so we are happy that we are in the winning team We're going and we're running the race, as St. Paul says. And I run all the way to the end. And the one who survives, the one who goes all the way, receives the prize. And the prize is eternal happiness. The joy of entering into the mystery of how God is everywhere and His lights are everywhere. And we just are just so blinded because we sin. So we must purge ourselves of all attachment to sin. Let us ask Almighty God for this gift. We hope and pray that each and every month we come to you and we will try to progressively lead you along the lines to holiness. But you must be like Dominic Savio said with Don Bosco, like that little handkerchief that could be placed and molded into whatever shape Don Bosco wished. You must be like that. You must subordinate your will to the will of God. Not to anything else but to the will of God. And you will know it because your heart will begin to become more light and cheerful and recognize that no matter what happens out there, God is within me. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.